Hey friends, um, I know this morning it was a little unconventional. I had to cancel last minute, um, but now I'm doing my Bible study. It is 2.30 in the afternoon and my little one's over there um, playing a little bit. We are going to jump into our Bible study, so let's pray and we'll get started. Dear God, I come to you today and I ask that you would please God my my mind and my thoughts and my words to honor you alone. I pray that as we study Amos chapter 6 through 9, God, that you would be glorified and exalted, God, that nothing would be said that was untrue. God, I pray that you are um, lifted high uh, as we go through these chapters, God, that we see something new about you, that we're able to see your face. God, we love you so incredibly much. Forgive us where we fail you. We'll give you all the praise. Hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Amos chapter 6 through 9 is where we are today. And there's just a few things that I wanted to talk to you all about. So the first thing is in chapter 6, it starts out by saying, so we know that Amos was a prophet, but he wasn't a prophet by trade. He actually was just called by God to go to Israel and tell them what was about to happen. Um, and my glasses are annoying you because of the reflection. I'm so sorry, but... My head is still pounding, um, so that's why I'm having to wear them so that I can function. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, Amos was not a prophet by trade. He was actually a shepherd. He did something with sheep. So he talks about being a herdsman, so likely he was a shepherd, which, you know, in, in Israel and Judah, in the world, that was like bottom of the totem pole type thing. Like it wasn't a prestigious job. It was somebody who was with the sheep all the time, um, Another, you know, commentary said that he could have been a sheep seller. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that herdsman, shepherd, that was terminology that could interchange for that, which would have made him a businessman, which would have made him a little bit higher on the social ladder. But um, I tend in my heart to lean towards the fact that he was a shepherd because we know that that example is used so many times in Scripture as you know, an example for pastors and oh, Jesus being the good shepherd and all that kind of stuff. So we know that that's frequently used. So if he was just a shepherd, that is um, an amazing, you know, connection to all those other scriptures as well. But we know that he was sent to tell Israel and Judah, Judah was a part of it too, that all the surrounding nations would be persecuted for their rejection of God, but also Israel and Judah would suffer persecution because of their rejection of God. And we ended yesterday in chapter 5 by God basically saying, I hate all of your religious rituals. Like everything that you're doing that I've told you to do, yes, you're doing everything that I told you to do as far as the law goes and your sacrifices and stuff like that, but you're doing it out of ritual and not from a heart of true worship, which is what God has always required. We talked about how it's not a fake it till you make it religion. And so in chapter 6, Amos starts out um, by saying, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, which was the capital of Judah, Jerusalem, um, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. And I wanted to read the study note here. It says, Amos included the Judeans in his warning, both Zion, which is Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, were strong fortresses, easily defended, but God's people should never be confident in their own power. So these strong capital cities were likely a place of just comfort. They thought that they could not be overtaken. They thought that they were, you know, ultimately a supreme power against their enemies. And they depended on their own strength instead of God to really help them overcome their enemies and to protect them. And so I wrote, maybe they felt untouchable or maybe they depended on their own strength. You know, and it says it right there. You who are at ease in Zion, which was the capital Judah, Jerusalem, and those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. So they thought that these capital cities being in areas are easily defendable or being places where they felt like they had control over gave them um, security and ease. And it is the most dangerous place to be in when we think that our own efforts and our own things that we've built up are what keeps us secure. Um, so you flip on over to verse 2, and it talks about um, other places surrounding those. And it's really referring to the fact that they were so secure in these cities. But it says um, at the second part of... <laughs> 
chapter or verse two of chapter six, it says, are you better than these kingdoms? The ones that just listed in part A of verse two, or is their territory greater than your territory? So these stronger cities that were mentioned um, were stronger than Zion and Samaria. So that it's not like they had the strongest cities that were ever built. You know, there were stronger cities that have been taken down. So they need to be careful in thinking that they have control over their own protection and their own security because ultimately God is the one that has been protecting them and keeping them secure from their enemies. Um, it's, a, it's so important to never forget that God is where our ultimate protection lies, that we can't do it in our own strength and that nothing that we do um, in our own efforts will ever produce anything fruitful for the kingdom of God. You know, like we can be so ignorant to think that we can, you know, I'll put it this way. I read a quote one time that said, everything that we have is because God has allowed us to have it. And that could not be more true. Like we don't get anything based on our own strength. If we, even the breath that we breathe to be able to do the things that we do is a gift from God because he holds us. He holds our tomorrow. He holds our right now. And so he is the ultimate giver of life and he is the one who deserves all of the glory and honor and praise for it. So, um, Anyways, moving on over to chapter 7, um, Amos had three visions, and these were warning visions. And the first two, which the first one is verse um, 1 through 3, I think is where it ends. And it was about locusts that come and um, eat all of the grass of the land. So basically wipe out anything that could help them, you know, vegetate the land or anything like that. And... Amos appeals to God and asks him not to do that, and the Lord says, it shall not be. And so the second one comes along, and it was a judgment by fire, and devoured the great deep, and ate, it up, ate up the land, as it says in verse 4. And then Amos appeals to God again, please don't do this. And God says in verse 6, um, this shall not be, says the Lord God. Okay, so then we go to verse 7. This is the third like vision. It says, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So the plumb line here, I got this from the ESV um, Jesus Bible. So y'all know this is my newest addition to my Bible collection, but I had this open when I was reading this morning and the plumb line is actually um, like a weight on the bottom of a line and it showed if something like a wall was actually straight or just had the appearance of being straight. So it was like a, um, a measure, you know, like the, the um, little things with the bubbles that you put to make sure something's even. Well, this is kind of like a vertical, I guess, way that they measured that. So they would drop this line by like a wall or something and it would show them if it was actually straight or just looked like it was straight. So um, my thought with this is God is measuring the people. Like, do you actually look, just look like you're following me or are you truly doing it? Like if I drop a plumb line in the midst of my people, you're just going to give the appearance of following me. It's not going to be actually true to what I've called you to do. And my question for us is how would we measure up? You know, would we just have the appearance of following Jesus or would we actually measure up to the faith that we claim that we have? And I know that we all fall short, that there are times where we all mess up, but in the entirety of our life, are we moving closer to sanctification or are we just pretending? And that is a heart check, you know, something that we need to ask ourselves, like, am I just going through the motions of my faith or am I actually trying to live out the faith that I claim that I have? Um, are we devoted to Jesus or just outwardly appearing to be? Kind of one of those serious heart check moments right there. Um, the next part of our, our chapter seven is Amos is accused of... <sighs> 
basically making all of this up, um, um, Amiza, Amiza, the priest of Bethel, y'all know I'm terrible with these names, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And um, Amazi said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there and never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. So he's saying, go to Judah and tell them about all of this stuff. Don't tell us because Judah was included in some of the fall. But Israel was pointed out a lot in Amos. Um, so then in verse 14, Amos responds to the priest and says, Then Amos answered and said to um, Amaziah, I think is how you say it, now that I'm looking at it, Amaziah maybe, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. He's saying this wasn't what I did for a living, nor was it something that was passed down from generation. I wasn't born into this, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be divided up in the measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land and all and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. So Amos is saying, I didn't ask. This was not a legacy that was passed down to me. Like I didn't take this on by myself. God called me out of what I was regularly doing. My regular occupation, God called me out of that to be able to come to you guys and tell you what God showed me. And so what Amos is saying here is like, I'm just doing what the Lord has told me to do. And this is what's about to happen. He's telling um, the priest who will probably pass it on to Jeroboam, which is the king, what is about to happen. So God, what I saw in this part of scripture that stuck out to me so much was that God will call the unlikely to accomplish his plan because the unqualified by man is the overqualified by God. And you know why that is? Is because so many times in scripture we see, like you've heard it, you've, you've seen it so many times how, um, you know, like Noah was a drunk and um, Moses did his own thing. And there's this whole list that you could look up online about all the different people in scripture that David was a murderer and an adulterer. Like there's so many different people that God used that would be unqualified by the likes of a man. But unqualified by man is overqualified by God because he gets the glory from it. So that's why he uses people who normally wouldn't be put in that position because he knows he's going to get the glory from it. And ultimately he's the only one that deserves it. So it's such a beautiful translation to the fact that when we are saved and when we do have works that God calls us to do for the kingdom of God, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to do those things. And it's so that we can't boast and we can only boast of Him. We can't boast of ourselves. We can only boast of His goodness and His glory and His grace. Okay, so then in chapter 8, we go on... Um, in verse, in, well, it's talking about the coming day of a bitter morning, like all of this stuff that's about to happen. But in verse 11 is where it gets really real. Okay, so verse 11 of chapter 8 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Famine was something that terrified them. It was something that could wipe out an entire population because they didn't have, you know, the Walmart to go to. It was destruction. It was a terrible time, probably of a lot of fear, of a lot of questions, didn't know what was about to happen. Um, but God is like, I'm not sending it of food and water. I'm sending it of the word of the Lord, of hearing from the Lord, which is terrifying. Um, verse 12 says, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. You know, um, Malachi also talks about this and there's years of silence before Jesus, before the New Testament and Je Jesus enters the picture where um, it's called the silent years, you know, where God basically just leaves Israel to what they've asked for all along, you know, which is just the actions of faith without actually 
following the Lord and hearing his voice and doing what he calls them to do. And, you know, I wrote a famine of the only thing that can truly satisfy. That what, that's what makes these few verses so terrifying is it is a famine of the only thing on in all of creation that can truly satisfy, which is living bread and living water that only comes from God. It's our source of life. Hearing from God, I can't, I have been through dry seasons where I felt like God has been silent and it has felt like the longest days and weeks of my life. I cannot imagine it being like a famine time where God just refuses to speak. Not only just to me, because I can go to church and I can still feel His presence and know that He's with me and maybe He's just being quiet for a time so that I will learn something or maybe I need to repent of something or something like that. But I cannot imagine there being a time where God's Word was just completely void, where He didn't speak, where He withheld all prophecies back in this day where nobody preached the word because God just wasn't wasn't speaking you know they didn't have Bibles to read they didn't have you know the hope of Jesus even though it was prophesied and told to them that the Messiah was coming they didn't know how that would all play out like we do and so I can't imagine but remember all of this was brought on by their own um, disobedience. So all of this was just a result of their own choosing of their own way ever since he brought them out of Egypt. Literally ever since they came out of Egypt and saw all those signs and miracles, the people of Israel have chosen to not follow the Lord wholeheartedly. They have constantly worshipped false gods. They've constantly worshipped idols. They have constantly turned and done their own thing when God has told them to do differently. And so all of their actions were just leading up to God's reaction and his you know, punishment basically for that. There has to be correction. Without correction, there's no love. Without correction, there is no love. And that is what God is trying to teach them. And we see that in, in chapter 9. Because God talks about in the first part of chapter 9 through Amos, the destruction of Israel, but he doesn't leave it there. And that's the God that we serve. Like, he never leaves it with destruction. There is always hope. There is always hope until the end of time when everyone has made their final decision on following God or not. There is always hope. There is still hope. And so verse 11 starts out the restoration of Israel. This is where we are. And it says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old. That tent of David that has fallen, that's that will be raised up. That's Jesus' resurrection. A commentary said that. And it was such a beautiful picture of like the um, Davidic line, the king, the ultimate king of kings and Lord of lords rising again. This prophesied Messiah coming as the hope and the restoration of Israel. This is it. He is it, you know. Verse 12 says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. This is actually quoted in Acts and it says specifically the Gentiles too. So it doesn't just claim the Jews. All nations includes the Gentiles. And this is because, as we've talked about before, God grafted us in to the promise. God grafted us into the adoption as sons and daughters. That Gentiles means anybody that's not a Jew. So probably if you're watching this, that means you. And so God grafted us in and allowed us to be a part of it. So this restoration didn't just include only Israel. It was all the nations. God's going to... He's going to restore all nations to him who are called by my name. When he calls you by name, friend, he wants you. Like, he wants you to come to him. You are being restored to what you were created for. It's so beautiful, his grace and his mercy on us. It says, declares the Lord who does this. Um, Verse 13 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed? The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruits. And I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. All of that if you read the commentaries, is like the picture of the Garden of Eden before the fall. 
So all of that beautiful picture, I'm, I'm assuming all of this restoration is pointing to the day when, you know, right now, and it talks about this in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. It talks about how right now Israel, most of Israel is hardened for a time so that all of the Gentiles can be saved. But there's coming a time in the, during the tribulation where Israel will be reached for the gospel again. Um, it's just a period of time where God has um, allowed Gentiles to be grafted into the family, into the kingdom. And Israel's disobedience has, and their turning away from Jesus and crucifying him is what got us to this point. And so um, they are hardened for a time so that the Gentiles have the opportunity to come to know Christ. And so um, God outreached to all of the nations, just like he says, so who, who, who he calls by name, that's us. And we get to be a part of what he's doing and the restoration of Israel. But in the end times, there is a period of time where Israel is going to, God's going to fulfill his promise and he's going to give them the opportunity to turn back to him. And it's going to be such a beautiful reconnection and redevotion to God. And so, um, anyways, all of this, I, I, from what I can gather, and you may think differently, other commentaries may think differently, but I see this in light of the true restoration that happens at the end of time because we know that like the picture of heaven and the new Jerusalem and all of that kind of stuff that is given to us in Revelation mimics the the Garden of Eden and what we were originally designed to do, which is work for the kingdom of God. So a lot of people think, well, I'm just going to kick my feet up and relax while I'm in heaven. No, we're still going to have jobs. Like that's how God intended when he walked with us and talked with us and had, you know, communion with us like he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. It's going to be a picture of the same thing. You know, like we're going to work for the kingdom. We're going to still do productive things. You know, we may still garden. There's just not going to be thorns. We may still do jobs and different things that we were intended to do all along with God. It's just not going to be in 150 degree weather in Mississippi heat, you know, and humidity. So this just to me is a picture of what's to come and the beauty of the true restoration that will happen when God wipes all sin away. And the verbiage here is so beautiful that it's, we're just going to be restored to how it was, how God has always wanted it to be with a relationship with us. And oh man, just praising Him and honoring Him for all of eternity, not only with our worship and our spontaneous acts of worship with him in heaven but also in everything that we do in all the work that we do in every aspect of every breath that we breathe and never having to fight the flesh and constantly giving him glory because he rightfully deserves it dear god we thank you so much for always giving hope and always pointing to hope and always giving us the opportunity to know that we have hope in you no matter what life throws our way, no matter how many times we mess up, God, you are a restoring God. You want a relationship with us. You want to commune with us. You love us so much, and we love you. Thank you for showing us your truths. In Jesus' name, amen.